not sure where the time went, so we're going way after. But I will say, there's, there's tensions that I feel in my heart. I do not want to shortchange the Word of God. I don't. But I also want to be sympathetic to our children's workers. So, if it gets to noon, a little bit after noon, feel free, get up, go get your kids in the nursery. Go back and get them, and if I'm still going, come and listen. But I'm going to do my best, all right? I'm going to do my best. But I do not, I don't want to shortchange God, because this is a beautiful text that we have right here. So let's pray. Father, we come before you. Oh, Lord God, help us to see clearly. That's been my prayer all week long, that we would see you clearly from this text. Oh, that you are a good, good Father who loves His child. A lot of us have wrong notions, see you as an angry God all the time. Lord, you are a tender God, compassionate God, full of mercy and grace. So help us to see that, Lord. And, and I'm seeing underneath, Lord, I'm, I'm seeing some doctrines that maybe people haven't thought about ever, or when they do, they're like me. When I first started reading these doctrines of choosing and human will and all that kind of stuff, Lord, the struggles. And so I just, I pray that you would meet with us. Help us to see it for what it really is. It's a blessing and it's a wonderful grace that you have come to save anybody at all. And may this just awaken worship and gratefulness in our hearts to you. That's my prayer. So come meet with us and use me, Lord, as your mouthpiece, I pray in Christ's name. Now, this first slide, I want you parents to take a good look at these slides. And even if you're not a parent, maybe you can relate to these slides. If your dad did this with you when you were a child and helped you walk for the very first time or ride your bike for the first time and cleaned up your bloody knees when you wrecked your bike, that's what a loving father does. Grabs their kids up in their arms and holds them tight and holds on to their little itty bitty hands when, when he's teaching them how to walk. And, and when they fall down, they, they get down to their level and they scoop them up in their arms. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing as we think about loving fathers. This is what we're going to see with God today. In this passage, it's incredible. It's one of the most tender passages, I think, in all of the Bible where we see God's fatherly heart. And at the same time, how His fatherly heart is just torn apart over His wayward child who doesn't want anything to do with Him anymore. After all of those years of teaching, your child had to walk, and when he fell down, helped him up, and put Neosporin on his knees and put a band-aid on his knees and now the kid's all grown up and doesn't want anything to do with dad anymore. This is incredible. Rejects him right out. Actually calls somebody else their father. This is, this is what's happening to God this morning. And I think it's devastating. I think he's heartbroken over his wayward child and now he has to punish them for their sins. Because they were bent. We see that word. They were bent bent away from him, and his heart is recoiling in him. That's what the text says. His heart is recoiling in himself. So much so that we're going to see the flow and the rhythm of this. He has so much mercy in him that he wants to save some people. That's, that's what's happening here. That's what we see from beginning to finish in the Bible. He's got to punish sin. He's got to punish all sinners. But he wants to save some. He's so full of mercy and love and grace, he wants to save some. And so that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to see this morning in, the, in, its, in this text. And it's a wonderful, wonderful promise that he saved, that he's promised to save a remnant. A remnant. And it includes you. So I don't want you to tune this whole thing out because this applies to Christians. But first, we've got to look at the pain. Let's look at the pain that he went through over the nation of Israel. As a whole, they rejected him. Even though he adopted him, his own son. He loved him like a son. Look at verse 1 where God says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. I called my son. He's talking about 
Israel when they were in Egypt as slaves. Joseph passes off the scene. Remember, he's second highest commander in Egypt. And his people grew in such a number that the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, got scared of being overrun with them. And so he made them into slaves. So keep in mind, Israel's not quite a nation yet. However, the promises of God were made already to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that you will be the father of many nations, starting with the nation of Israel, who wasn't formed yet. They were slaves. But you remember the story. God sees their oppression over 400 years, tells Moses, I'm going to send you to set my people free, make them a nation, and make them my children. So that's what God is referring to here when he says that Israel was a child, a newly formed nation. But I don't want you just to read over that and not feel this. My child. My child. That's the word, the term that God is using here. Or when he says, out of Egypt I called my... My son, dang, this is incredible. This is glorious truth that God is choosing to adopt these people as his very own children and that he would be their father. How incredible is that? That the Lord God of this universe that made heaven and earth would call you his child, his son, who he loves with his whole heart. Look at what he, what he says next. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Period. Don't miss this. I loved him. This was something in God that he freely chose to do. It does not say, I loved him because they loved me. Or they worshipped me. Or they're even interested in me. I loved him. Gang, you know this. We've been looking at Hosea. They were not worshiping God. They were not serving God. They were not obeying God. So God loved them for that? No. You know what they were like. They did not deserve to be loved. They didn't have anything in them that was deserving of his Love, this love was entirely based on, on the free, chosen, electing love of God that he, he set on them. And it's the same love that he chose to set on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you remember from your Bible reading, Abraham came from a land of pagan worship. And God came to him. God came to him. This is what Moses told them in Deuteronomy 7. God says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Which is what Hosea is referring to next in Hosea when it says that out of Egypt I called my son, gathered them as a nation, led them out of the land of Egypt, split the Red Sea in two so they could cross on dry ground, escape the pursuing Egyptians who I will cover up with water and destroy them all because these are my children. I love my children children. You noticed in the text, I chose you. I might raise questions about this whole doctrine that people have been fighting over for years. <laughs> right? Maybe you've never even heard of this doctrine. Or maybe you struggle over it like I did when I started contemplating these things. When I first became a Christian, I thought, what in the world did God choose His people? What do you mean God chooses people? From the foundation of the world? Be before anyone who was ever born, God chose a people, Ephesians 1. He set His love on them, and He adopted them, and He redeemed them with the blood of Christ, and He sealed with the Spirit. What do you mean? I thought He treated everybody the same. Equally the same. Because they all have, they all have freedom of 
choice. It's up to them at the end of the day to choose God or not. So it's, it's not God's fault at all, or it's not unfair to pick a people to choose to love and to save. Those are all normal questions that anybody should be asking, and rightfully so. Because in the Bible, you see pleas to respond to the gospel, to believe the gospel, be saved by the gospel, repent, be saved, and the person responds. They're supposed to respond to the gospel. We see that in the Bible, right? Right? Human responsibility. We see that, but we also see in the Bible that a person will not and cannot respond to the gospel unless God does a work in them first, which is what we call the new birth which I believe he gives to all of his chosen people out of mercy and sheer grace and love. No one comes to me, Jesus said, unless the Father draws. No one comes. And gang, I know, good, good, honest Christians, they wrestle over these things. And it's okay to wrestle over them and and talk about them back and forth. It's what I'm seeing underneath all all of this. It's how the chapter goes. He's going to save a remnant because God is full of mercy out of, out of all of fallen mankind that deserves condemnation. God's going to have mercy. He's going to have mercy by the time we get to the end. But let's talk about, let's talk about verse 2 where he says to them out of Egypt that called my son. And this is an incredible thing for God to say. Clint taught on this. This was wonderful teaching over in India. How the Jews thought of God as so holy and high and almighty, they would would not call Him by His full holy name. They wouldn't do that. Let alone think of God as a Father. Never, no way. And yet that's how He wants to be known and seen here. Even back, He told Moses, "Tell tell Pharaoh this. When you call Israel out of Egypt, thus says the Lord, Israel, my firstborn son, let my son go, that he may serve me. Exodus 4.22. Here's my interpretation. Get your hands off my kids. That's my interpretation. You got me to deal with. I thought thought about my dad. My dad could beat up your dad, man. Don't mess with me. My dad's bigger than your dad. My dad's stronger than your dad. Don't mess with me. That's what I'm seeing here. Oh, it's because he loves them. He loves them. I th- I, correct me if I'm I think that's the first time we see God referenced his father in the whole Bible when he said that. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, if you know your Bible, this ought to ring bells. Out of Egypt, I called my son. If you want to, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. You remember this story. After the angel of the Lord told Joseph in a dream, what did he tell him? Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you. For Herod, king of Israel, remember this, is about to search for the child to destroy him. Child, singular. Now, what do you mean? Child, singular. Child, back in Hosea, plural. You mean the whole nation of Israel. So who's this child? We'll answer that. He rose and took the child, his mother, by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Right here. What we're reading right here in Hosea chapter 11. Right here. Out of Egypt I call, called my son. Matthew is talking about prophecy. Fulfillment of prophecy. But is it Israel? It's not Israel. It's Jesus Christ. It's Christ who came into the world from God himself. Heaven's throne became flesh and blood and dwelt among us, John says in his gospel. But Matthew loves to use types in his gospel. So he's comparing the nation of Israel who were the sons of God to the one and only true son of God. Oh, so in Matthew's gospel, you have 40 days in the desert being tempted by the devil. What does that reflect? Anybody say it? 40 years in the wilderness, wandering from the Israelites. He loves these things. You have Jesus up on the mountainside teaching the people the law of God, just like God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at the mountain of 
Sinai. Good, you're with me. Stay with me. You've got to answer questions. Keep me awake. Just like Moses, right? Fed the people manna in the desert. Jesus Christ comes along and he feeds 20,000 people with bread. So yes, the Jews are called the children of God, the sons of God. They called out of the lands of Egypt to fulfill their destiny, but they failed, gang. Hear me. They failed over and over and over and over again. But when you get to Matthew, you get to this son. This is my true son right here. This is my true son from heaven, who I will preserve from Herod and call out of Egypt so he can fulfill what it really means to be my son in loving relationship with me and loving obedience to me and loving holiness. And he will be a light to the world where they failed to be that light. Praise God for Jesus. He's different from us. He's different from them. Look at how they respond to God. Even though God's lovingly calling them all the time. Look at verse 2. The more they were called. The more they were called. I want you to feel God's heart. The more they were called by me. That's what God is saying. To repent. Turn away from your sinful ways. Come back to me, your Father. We've seen this over and over again in the book of Hosea. Return to the Lord that He may heal us. That's in chapter 6. Return to the Lord that He will bind us up. Return to the Lord and He will revive us and raise us up. Plead with her, Hosea. It's chapter 2. Plead with your mother, meaning Israel. Plead. Plead to her, for she's not my wife, and I'm not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face. Return to your husband. Oh, would I redeem them, God says in chapter 7. But they speak lies against me. And the more I called to them as a loving father, he says here, the more they went away. Meaning the more they resisted and did with my love or my salvation, or my righteousness, or my goodness, or, or, or accountability. So, Y'all got to want that, oh God, I don't want that. I want something else. I, I want Baal. I want sin. I want stuff. They kept sacrificing to the Baals, burning offerings to idols. That's what it says right there in verse 2. Hey, Baal, man, Baal lets us do what we want to do. You know, of all the immorality we want, actually pleases them. They approve of it. And they give us more stuff because of this. Why would we want to give that up, God? All the sinful pleasure that we can have, that the Baal gods approve and bless. God, we don't want to repent of that. We don't want to stop worshiping Baal for you. Now here's my question. When I'm reading the Bible, do you do this? I'm asking, why would they do that? Would you ask that question? When you read the Bible, do you say why a lot? I say why, and I say, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean here? So that's what I'm asking right here. Why would they respond that way to, to constant calling of a heavenly Father who loves them to, to repent of their sin and return to me? I'm going to give you a little theology. I'm going to tell you why, according to the Bible, and what the Bible says, and this applies, what the Bible says about sinful man apart from Christ and the work of God, that gives you the Spirit, that causes you to be born again, and makes you alive without that gang. No one will come to God. No one will see God for who He is. No one will see Christ for who He is. How did Peter even know that Jesus was the Christ? Who revealed that to Peter? Did Peter come with that, up with that all by himself? The Father revealed that to you, Peter. So what's going on here? I think it's because every human being is dead in sin. Totally depraved. That's the word we call it. They are spiritually dead in sin. And we read about this in Ephesians chapter 2. And these people, they just show it. They show it. They show the human condition. Which I would not say is completely free. And able. Choose God, not choose God. God. They will reject God every time unless the Spirit doesn't work in their life. That means dead, gang. 
not wounded, not partially alive. Ephesians 2 says, dead. You're completely dead. You're like Lazarus in the tomb, physically dead. And this was all, this is the condition of every single human being apart from God doing a work. And I know it's tough to hear, but it's true. Ephesians 2 goes on to say that we're dead in sin and also slaves to the world's ways. We're slaves to the devil's will. That's what it says. We are sons of disobedience. And once we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, we were nat- by nature objects of wrath like the rest of mankind, just like them. That's why they reject God, friends. That's why. Because their human will is not free in the sense, I can choose God or not. I can choose good or not. I can just come to Christ on my own. It's bound. That's why Martin Luther would write a book called The Bondage of the Will. He said, this was my most important work ever. I need people to understand that they are dead in sin. It is bound. It is bound. It's not as free as we like to think it's free. And that's why they're doing what they're doing, gang, and have a bent. Look at verse 7. They got a bent on turning away from God. It's a sinful bent away from God, just like we had before Christ and why others that you know reject Christ now because they're dead. They're bent on sin. So all of this to say is we give massive thanks to God for making us alive. The only reason we're sitting in here today is because of God's grace, God's mercy. That he made us alive. That's where Ephesians 2 goes. But God, who's rich in mercy, made you alive together with Christ. Now, I don't know why he does that for so many others. I don't know that. He doesn't tell us that. All we're supposed to do is to preach to everybody. You just let him do the saving. That's up to him. Okay? You just preach. You just preach the gospel. But I just want you to understand the human condition and the need for God. To do a work. So when you're evangelizing, when you're going to share the gospel with somebody, you, you know what you want to pray? God, would you open their eyes? Don't we ask Him to do this? God, would you open their heart? Would you make them spiritually alive to see Christ for who He is? So that they'll repent and believe. This is God's work, gang. Salvations of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Now, here's something else that I thought of. (laughs) If they continually reject you, know that the Israelites continually rejected God. You see that? It says that God called them a lot. (laughs) And so we were even talking about this a little bit in our Sunday school class in evangelism. And I'm thinking as I'm reading this, do I need to change my philosophy, tweak it a little bit in my evangelism, especially when people reject me and push me away? I think to myself, okay, I better better back off, (laughs) right? Don't we say that? Sometimes we have to. It's like throwing pearls before swine, but I don't see that right here in this text. God's always after them. He's coming. He's coming. He's calling to them. Come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. If they reject, they reject. Some of you, I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to feel guilty, gang, if you're sharing the gospel with somebody, maybe a family member, and they keep rejecting you. And and you say to yourself, oh man, maybe I pushed too hard. Listen to me. God's really pushing hard. God did it. So you're okay to do that. Preach the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel to them. Now if they get belligerent, and they're ready to come at you, Or if they reject you 500 times, maybe that's when it becomes thrown pearl before swine. You say, okay, I'll just wait. I'll wait for God to do a work. Maybe they'll approach me and ask me a question. You see that in the text? The more I call, God calls. And he wants us to call. He wants us to preach the gospel. Just an interesting tidbit I thought of there. And I think, and when you're preaching the gospel, we want to tell them about both his judgment and also his fatherly love. Oh my goodness, this is, this is incredible to me. God's love is like a, a father who taught his kids and took care of their hurts. Look at verse 3. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. It was not Baal. 
It was me who saved them from Egypt and saved them from their enemies and lead them the whole time through the wilderness, providing for them and healing them when they got hurt, like a loving father who teaches his kids how to walk. It's why I showed those slides in the beginning. This is incredible talk and imagery from God. It's almost like God is getting down on our level just to show you, show you what I'm like. I'm just like a loving father. I remember hearing John Calvin say, this whole book is like baby talk from God when he wants us to understand him. This is what he's doing. This is imagery. This is beautiful imagery. It's like dad or mom holding on to their little one's hands, teaching him how to walk. I took them up by their arms. It's what he's saying. I was loving to Israel like you are with your child. I was tender with Israel like you are with your child. And when they fell down and they scraped their knee, I scoop them up. I carried them to the bathroom. I cleaned it up. I put some Neosporin on them. I, I put a band-aid on it. That was me to Israel. That's what he's saying. Feel his heart. Can you feel his heart? That's his heart here. It wasn't Baal, it was me. Baal didn't provide for them. It was me. It was me the whole time from their infancy until now. Verse 4, I led them with cords of kindness. That's how they would have done it back in that day. They would have taught their kids how to walk with cords. We just grabbed their hands. I led them with bands of love, he says. I led them. I gave them victory after victory after victory victory. I gave them my presence, a fire and a cloud. I gave them manna to eat. I gave them water from the rock. And when they complained about not having meat, man, I gave them so much quail, it came out of their ears. Literally. It was me who drove out the inhabitants of the promised land so that they could have a land flowing with milk and honey. It was me. It was me. It was me. It was me showing them love and kindness and mercy. It was me who gave them the law to keep them from sinning. And when they sinned, it was me that gave them the atonement so that they could be forgiven of their sins. Do you see how wonderful God is? Do you see how merciful He is? And people think He's nothing but a cruel killer in the Old Testament. That's the furthest thing from the truth. I became to them, verse 4, as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. He's referring to Egypt. Slaves. I took that yoke off. I came down to them to provide for them. It's in the rest of the verse. I bent down to them and fed them. This is unbelievable mercy and love. Provision. Like a wonderful father who they do not want any more. Or even give credit anymore. I want you to think of This is what I was thinking about this past week. For you parents or you not parents, maybe you can think of your parents. Imagine, imagine you as a dad or your dad teaching you how to walk. He's the one that taught you how to ride a bike. He's the one that was there when you fell down. Your dad, maybe, maybe more your mom, changed your diapers. I do that, by the way. Cleaned up your vomit. I've done that a million times. You take care of your kid's wounds. You run them to the hospital for that kid. You provide every meal for that kid that they've ever had. Every shred of clothes. And then all of a sudden, that kid says to you, you never did anything for me. It wasn't you. You weren't there for me. It was, I don't know, it was my stepdad or my stepmom. They were the ones who did all of that to me. That's how God feels right now. Can you understand how God feels right now? I did it all. And you say he did it? You're giving your love and affection to Him? Credit to Him? This is what they're doing to God. Gang, they believed that Baal delivered them out of Egypt. They made a calf. They believed that Baal taught them how to walk. 
They believed that Baal took them up by the arms. They believed that it was Baal that healed their wounds. They believed that it was Baal that led them with cords of kindness and with the bands of love. They believed that it was Baal who eased the yoke on their jaws. They believed that it was Baal who bent down and fed them their food. And you know what I did as I read that? I repented on their behalf. I was so sorry, God, they did that to you. And then, duh, I'm so sorry I did that to you. And then I thought, oh God, help us. Help us to never do this as your children. Please, oh God, help us to acknowledge you. Give you credit for being our Father who taught us how to walk, who led us with cords of kindness and bands of love. It was you who provided every spiritual blessing. It was you that provides every physical blessing. And then I thought of Thanksgiving. Oh, Lord, I know we've quoted this here. Oh, you're doing 10,000 things, and I only recognize maybe five or ten. Lord, help us to see your hand in every good thing, because it comes from you. Every spiritual blessing, every physical blessing. Oh, God, help us to see your hand. He's doing a million things in our lives every day. Amen? Think about that this Thanksgiving. Think about it every day. It was God, gang, who made us who sustains us, who called us, who saved us, who provided every shred of clothes, who's given us every morsel of food. It was God. It was God. Now here's here's where the world gets it wrong. Where they believe that God will always love and never judge unrepentant sinners. He's still a holy God. Verses 5-7. through seven. We've seen this. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. Verse 5. They shall not return to the land of Egypt. That's where they were before. And he says, Assyria shall be their king. So it's going to be Assyria. It's not Pharaoh. Assyria's going to come. They're going to take you away. They're going to take you away. And so it's natural to ask the question, Why? Why? Why, God? Remember, it's God doing this. On the face of it, it looks like a serious coming, but God's behind this. And so we ask, why? He says why. They've refused to return. They refuse to return. That's another way of saying they did not repent. They did not repent of their false worship to Baal and stop doing it and start worshiping me. They refuse to repent of their sinful sexual orgies. They did not stop doing it and follow me and obey me and love me. They did not refuse to stop lying and swearing and committing adultery, chapter 4, and ask for my forgiveness and trust in my atonement and worship me instead of Baal. They refused to do it. And so again, he asked the question, why? It's because of their sin nature. It's their bent. It's verse 7. They're bent on turning away from God. So verse 6, back to slavery you go. Sword shall rage against their city, consume the bars of their gates, devour them because of their own counsels. Their own counsels. Their own counsels. I want you to hear that. Their own counsels. Their own counsels. Their own counsels. Their own counsels. And I thought to myself, this is where we get into trouble when we trust our own counsels. This means your own self-talk, the things that you say to yourself, the beliefs that you hold, gang. If they don't come from the book, we get in trouble. So what are they counseling themselves with? Oh man, look at the gods of those other nations. That's what we want. We want a king. We want Baal. I mean, he lets them do whatever they want to do, man. We can have all this and, and look at Look at them, they seem to be doing okay, so, so Baal's okay with what they're doing, and he's actually blessing them. I think we can adopt their God too. We can add them to our, eh, every once in a while we'll throw a bone. We're Jews, we've got to throw a bone to God. Do you, do you see how your own counsels, gang, and I'm going to tell you right now, don't ever trust your own counsel. Your own self-talk. Because it's mixed with sin. That's why the Bible says to take every thought captive. 
and make it obedient to Christ. That will change your life if you fight that war. You have to fight that war. Gang, do not trust your own self-talk, your own self-counsel. That's why David would say, that's why he would preach to himself. Why are you so downcast, O muscle? He's preaching to himself. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Preach God's truth to yourself every day. I'm telling you, it's going to change your life. All right. I could say more about that. So they're bent on turning away. And then it says, though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. Now this is a, this was interesting, very difficult trans, translation. People, people gave up, actually. <laughs> I read that in a bunch of commentaries. Commentators gave up. Apparently you can translate this in one of three ways. And I think they're all somewhat legit. I, I have a leaning, but you can translate this to mean the, the plural Baal gods on the high places. That's what some virgins do. Or you could translate this, like you probably have the ESV, as the most high God. Or some translations say they are appointed to the yoke and none shall remove it. And I'm not going to make a strong case for any of them except to say that they're all true. If you interpret this as the Baal gods... Okay, if you're interpreting this as the Baal gods, they're not going to lift a finger at all for you and save you. That works for me. Or if it's the most high God, which I lean toward, this is how I take it. They're calling out to him when, when they're in trouble. That's it. That's it, like unbelievers do. Like I did when I, was, when I wasn't saved. I was loving my sin. But when I got in trouble, I never thought about God any other time. But when I got in trouble, guess who I called out to? might have happened maybe five times on my hand. God says, I know your hearts. You really don't know me. You're just throwing me a bone. And so he's not going to lift a finger. Or the whole yoke deal. None shall remove it. This makes a little bit of sense because God, the loving Father, removed it before in verse 7. But now they're refusing to repent of their sins. So he's going to put the yoke of slavery back on their necks and nobody's going to spare them from Assyria. So take your pick, but here's the point. Oh, don't miss this. Oh, don't miss this. God does not take pleasure in this at all. Not at all. God is in agony over this. Look at verse 8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? That's Israel. How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I hand you over to Assyria? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebuim? These are the cities that were completely destroyed. They were in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were completely destroyed. They were doing wicked things. God destroyed them. And He's saying, how can I treat you that way? How can I give you up? And yet, if you remember from last week, these guys aren't doing any better than Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember from chapter 9, verse 8, from the days of Gibeah, you've sinned, O Israel. From the days of Gibeah. Do you remember what I said last week? That was when a man came into town and somebody was gracious enough to take him in, but the people of the town wanted to come and commit homosexual acts with him. And they gave him the concubine instead and they gang raped her all night long and she lay dead on their doorstep. And it caused massive uprising and bloodshed and violence everywhere. Gang, they deserve to be leveled like Sodom and Gomorrah right now. Which is why this is so amazing to me to see God's heart in absolute turmoil. Look at what he says next. My heart recoils within me. It recoils. My compassion grows warm and tender. Like a father. Maybe you've experienced this. Like a father who, who has to hand his son over. He's wayward. He's rebellious. You've got to hand him over to the judge or the authorities or, or even worse in this case to the electric chair. Or someone who's going to own him for the rest of his life. And you love that boy. You love that boy. You tried over and over and over again. You taught that boy how to walk. You taught that boy how to ride his bike. You taught that boy his math and, and science. You went to all of his soccer games. And then he turns on you. And refuses to call you his father. Receive his love. This is what God's dealing with here. And he's absolutely torn up about it. 
It's an amazing picture of God's heart. Gang, I think sometimes too many of us, myself included, we, we just think of God as unfeeling. Right? Unfeeling. He doesn't feel anything. He's like the distant deity up there that doesn't feel anything. Can I say this? He feels everything good to the max. It includes justice. It includes mercy. And so the question is, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? He has to punish sin, and yet he wants to enact mercy. What's he going to do? That's the question. I think he tells us in the rest of the chapter, he's going to save a remnant all the way down to this age where he saves us. He's going to save Jews, and he's going to save Gentiles. Look at verse 9. Then I'm going to go back to chapter 2 just for a little bit, but look at verse 9. I will not execute my burning anger. Praise God, gang. That's the greatest news anybody could ever hear right there. I will not again destroy Ephraim. I will not again destroy Ephraim. That means he's going to destroy Ephraim this time, but he's not going to again. We know that he does. We know that he does. According to the Bible itself in history, Syria's going to come, but he says, I'm not going to do it again, for I'm God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. I will not come in wrath. I am coming to save you this time, not in wrath. This is the incredible gospel of God, the heart of God, the mercy of God. Again, typically we think of God, and we think of His holiness, right? Oh my goodness, He's so holy, He means set apart. That means He's so mad at sin, which He is. He's going to come in wrath. He proves it here. He's going to come back again, and He's going to destroy every unrepentant sinner, But there's another response that he has here that's not like sinful man. Like somebody comes against you, does something, what do you want to do? Right? If you're in your flesh. That's a typical human response. God is saying to to us right here, I'm not going to respond like that. I'm going to respond with grace. I'm going to respond with mercy. Mercy. Grace instead of wrath. Mercy instead of destruction. I love what John Newton said about this. Listen to John Newton. Oh, if we had offended men or angels as we have offended our Creator and Redeemer and they had permission and power to punish us, our case would be utterly desperate. Only He who made us is able to bear with us all the attributes of the infinite God must, of course, be equally infinite as is His majesty and holiness. So is His mercy. That's the best thing you could ever hear right there. So is his mercy. It's what we see. I won't execute my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim. I will not come in wrath. For I am not a man. I am God, the Holy One in your midst. And gang, he has determined to save people. And he will do it. This echoes Numbers. Remember reading in Numbers 23? God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. God is saying right here, I'm going to save people. I'm going to save people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language, starting with Israel. Look at verses 10 and 11. They shall go after the Lord instead of turning away from him in the future. They shall go after the Lord because he will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west, and they shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord, because I roared from heaven. You know what I thought of? Aslan. Aslan, man, when Aslan roars, stuff happens. God's saying, yeah, I'm Aslan. When I roar, people are coming. And they're going to be trembling because Aslan's a little bit scary, but he's good. Wasn't that the line? He's not a tame lion, but he's good. That's our Lord, gang. This is the mercy of God. He's going to roar in saving mercy. He's going to roar, and he's going to call his people and they're going to come home. You know what I thought of? It catapulted me to John 10, the good shepherd. 